Praise the Lord. Galatians chapter 5. He even tells us in Galatians chapter 5, stand. All right? Amen. All right. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. We've been talking about liberty this month, and uh, the, the word of the Lord says, stand fast in your liberty. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for every promise in your word. We thank you, Lord, for the Spirit of God that is in this place. We pray, Lord, that you would use me, speak through me, anoint me, Lord God, not myself, but Lord, that the Spirit of the living God would speak through me to encourage your people. Lord, I pray for each one that's in here. Give them ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to receive what the Spirit of the Lord would say to them. And Lord, I pray, help us, teach us to stand fast in the liberty in that you have given us through Christ Jesus our Lord. And we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So as we continue on with our series, uh, we started the first week with this, and I asked you the question, what's the difference between liberty and freedom? And then I ask you, how free are you? We often think that liberty and freedom go hand in hand. We, we, we think they're interchangeable, but we hopefully learned during that first week that there's, there's something different about liberty. We, we say that we're a free nation, but how many of you would say just in the last few years, we've probably lost some of the freedoms that we once had? So freedom and liberty are different. Freedom is given to you by man, so therefore freedom can be taken by man. Liberty is given to us by God through Christ Jesus. Man cannot take it from you. You can surrender your liberty, but man will not take liberty from you, but man can take your freedom from you. Last week we looked at liberty versus legalism. That may be why the crowd down a little bit, I don't know, but anyhow... I had three or four people come up to me Wednesday night. They said, you're a brave man. I said, well, brave or stupid? I don't know, but anyways, there is a difference between liberty and legalism. Listen to this. Listen to this. Is your salvation, is your walk with God, is your relationship with the Lord based on rules or relationship? You need to ask yourself that when we do things. I think so many times as Christians, we get in this habit of rules. I don't come to church because I have to. I come to church because I want to. I don't lift my hands because they say, well, you're Pentecostal, you're supposed to. I lift my hands because I want to. I want to worship my Lord. It is about relationship. Sherrod and I have been married for 28 years. There's things that we do because of our relationship. I love her and I want to do those things. I had a, a, somebody ask me here not too long ago, they said, do you always open her car door? I said, for the last 25 years, I always open her door. It was pouring down rain the other day and we went someplace and I went around and I opened her door in the rain. She ran straight to the, where we were going in and she was dry. By the time I got there, I was soaked. I don't do that because of some rule. I do that because I love her. I do things because I love God. Not because some rule, some religious law says I have to do those things. Today I want to talk to you about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, as I've said many times before, I, I love history. I, I love history museums. I love going places, reading plaques. Uh, my wife says, oh me. And, and I, I just, I love reading history books. Uh, I, I enjoy history. I'm going to be really honest with you. When I was in school, um, I remember in college, my first semester in college, I took a history class. I actually... When I first came out of high school, I went to college because I wanted to be a history teacher in, in, the, in the public school system. Um, thank God that he called me to... Anyhow, um, but, but I remember my very first history class. I would, I would read the book. I would highlight... I mean, look, my, my, my textbook looked like, looked like a coloring book. I mean, I had colors and notes. And, and then everything that the professor was saying, that was back before the days of screens. And he would write stuff on a 
chalkboard, kids. It's called chalkboard. And he would write those things down on that. And I would write down everything that the professor said. And then I would rewrite everything the professor said. And I would rewrite just about everything that I highlighted in my book because my memory was not all that great. And I was writing as much down to try to get it. And I would take my test and I was not doing good. I was getting C's and D's. And the professor called me after like the second exam. He called me into his office. He said, we need to talk. He said, I don't want you to fail this course. He said, but obviously you're struggling. He said, I don't know how. He said, because I watch you and you write down everything that I say. And I just told myself, professor, I said, it's not so much the content as much as it is the dates. And so he looked at me. He started just asking me questions. And as he was asking, he said, you obviously know the material you struggle with the exact dates. And so he kind of helped me throughout that and, and gave me some, some things that I could do to help me remember the dates. But I just, I have such a passion for history. One of the things that I can tell you about my love for history is that I believe in the written Word of God. I believe that, 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 that everything in this Word, do you understand this is history? And everything in this Word, I, I believe it, in the way that it's written. I've got a good friend of mine. He went to college. He is a uh, um, studies rocks. Geologist. Study rocks. I don't know. I threw rocks. But he studied rocks. He's a geologist. And I remember going to Washington, D.C. with him one time. And we were talking. And, and as we went through one of the Smithsonian's, he said, I believe that the earth is millions, probably billions of years old. And I said, well, I disagree. And he, he started asking questions, you know, about things. And, and uh, you know, we kind of went back and forth. I said, I, I'm a day-age theorist, which means I, I believe that when, when God said, let there be, from that point on, the earth started. So I think the earth is probably somewhere around six to 8,000 years old. You may disagree with me, and that's fine. You have the right to. We'll figure it out when we get to heaven, and God says, I'm right. But anyhow... But I believe in every word of this book. I believe in the history of this word. There are some people that say, well, well, that was just kind of used for an example. I don't believe so. I believe it's written in there just the way many of those things happened. And it's funny when I talk to people about the Bible and how they interpret the Bible, they interpret our history, our American history specifically, in the same way. They, 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 they look at our history and they try to change our history. I've said this before, I don't believe that we're treat, teaching true history in our schools anymore. We're, we're teaching opinion history. Our nation was built on the principles of the Word of God. The problem with many in this nation and the problem with many Christians in our nation is this. Do you believe what you read or do you read what you believe? Let me say that again. Do you believe what you read or do you read what you believe? See, I read this book and I believe this book the way that I read it. But I know a lot of people, a lot of ministers that will pull certain things out of this book and read it to try to form an opinion. They'll try to twist the Word of God to make you think something that is not in this Word. Different denominations, different people groups read into the Word of God instead of reading and receiving from the Word of God. Don't read into the Word. Read from the Word. I believe history books many times are the same way. They are based on opinion and beliefs of the author and what they want the reader to believe. Many of our modern authors of history textbooks do not tell the whole truth or they try to change the truth to fit their opinion. For example, the Center for American Progress says this. The Center for American Progress says, many of our founding fathers, Washington, Jefferson, Franklin, Madison, and Monroe, practice a faith called deism. Deism is a philosophical belief in human reason and as a reliable means of solving social and political problems. Now first you've got to look at this quote and you've got to understand what this person is saying and then look at 
who the person works for that's saying it. It's the Center for American Progress. We have got people that are trying to progress this nation in a way that they're going to go back and they're going to try to edit history to get you to believe certain things. That our founding fathers were not Christians, but they just believed in some type of higher power. But more than anything, they believed in a system that had to do with political problems. They left, the truth is, they left England for that reason. It, they didn't come here seeking politics. They came here seeking freedom to worship. But we have people that want to write things like this to try to change the way our students are understanding history. Gregory Elder is a professor of history and humanities at Monroe Valley College, and he's also a Roman Catholic priest. Gregory Elder says this, of the 56 men who signed the Declaration, the great majority, perhaps all, identified themselves as Christians. And all but one were Protestants. Four were either present or former ministers, and a number of the signers were the sons of clergy. At least half of them had studied divinity at their various universities. David Barton is an American evangelical, uh, evangelical author and political activist for Christian nationalists. He's the founder of Wall Builders. David Barton said this, 52 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Orthodox Christians, deeply committed Christians. The other three all believed in the Bible as the divine truth of the Scripture and His personal intervention. If you, if you look at what David Barton said and you look at what Gregory Elder said, it lines up. If you look at what the Center for American Progress said and you try to find things that match that, you have a hard time finding something that justifies that. When I study the Word of God, I don't want to just pull out one passage of Scripture because that helps me feel good about what I'm trying to get you to believe. I want to line it up and make sure that out of the mouth are two or more, let every word be established. David Barton spent his entire life studying American history and collecting artifacts from our forefathers. He has collected more than 100,000 documents. More than 100,000 documents from before 1812. He's collected letters, sermons, newspaper articles, official documents, all from our founding fathers. I had the opportunity several years ago to meet David Barton in Washington, D.C. I spent three days with him. And I have seen many of his journals and the letters that he has. He, he, we were standing in the Capitol building and, and he had this big trunk that, that a couple men carried out and he started pulling out these documents and journals. And of course they were in, in, in protective wrap because they were so old, but he would pull them out and you could actually read letters from Jefferson. You could read letters from Washington. You could read letters from Hamilton. And David Barton says, I've went back and I've studied history from the source, not from opinion. Now I believe this saying is true regardless of what you're talking about, but the proof is in the pudding. He proved that our founding fathers were Christians. He didn't give opinion on what he thought. According to Brad Cummings of Shiloh Road Publishing, the publisher of the Founder's Bible, Brad Cummings said this, We have become a nation that has a tale of two histories. One that has deep, rich spiritual heritage that speaks of a godly purpose and destiny that was born in the heart of this nation as it was founded. And another that is progressively seeking to distance itself from that, trying to pretend it does not exist. We have many that are trying to write, rewrite history. They're trying to rewrite our American history and they're re trying to rewrite our biblical history. My point is that modern day educators are trying to change the truth of our Christian history. Our founding, fa founding fathers were men of God and our nation was established on godly principles. And as I shared in part one of this series, the Declaration of Independence begins with, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. 
that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Go with me to John chapter 8, verse 36. John chapter 8, verse 36. John chapter 8, verse 36, Jesus says, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. If the Son, if Jesus, if God incarnate, if, if God born of a virgin birth who lived on this earth for 33 and a half years, if God who went to the cross who died for you, if God who rose on the third day, if God who is still alive today has set you free, you are free because of relationships, not because of rules. Not because somebody wants to twist it and tell you you have to do all these certain things. I was talking to someone this, this past week that grew up Catholic. Did anybody here ever grow up Catholic? One. Uh, and, and that's the one I was talking to this week. And, and we were talking about this because I've got a good friend of mine back in Tennessee. I've known this man for probably, I don't know, 20, 25 years. And me and him were talking, man, he, he cusses like a Marine, and I can say that because I am one. He, I mean, he, he, he would make me blush. I mean, he, he drank. He, 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 I mean, he's, he's been married a couple different times. He's, he's got girlfriend. I mean, just he's not living the life that you and I were taught to live according to our Christian beliefs. And he and I would sit there and we would talk. And we always got along really good. We still do. But I would look at him and I said, do you believe that you're born again? He said, well, I believe that I'm saved. I said, tell me how you can live this lifestyle and believe that you're saved. He said, because when I was a baby, I was, I was baptized. When I was a teenager, I was confirmed. When I was, and he started going through, he said, the only thing I have left to do according to my faith is to make sure that there's a priest there when I die to, per, to perform last rites. I said, so as long as you've done all these A, B, C, D, E, F, G things that the Catholics tell you you can do, then you believe regardless of how the lifestyle you've been living, you're going to go to heaven. He said, that's what I believe. I said, well, what about what Jesus did? Have we based it on the rules of the Catholic Church or are we basing it on the Word of God that you're saved by Christ and Christ alone? Those who are made free by Christ Jesus are truly free. As I said already three times, I do what I do for Christ not because of a set of rules, but because of a relationship for what He did for me and how much He loved me that He poured out His blood for me. And so therefore, I want to live a life that's pleasing to Him. Not because of rules. The word free is the Greek word right here that means to liberate. The word free in John 8.36 is a word that means to liberate. Therefore, if the Son has liberated you, you are liberated indeed. This means that when a person comes to the Savior and receives eternal life from Him, that person is freed from the slavery of sin. They're freed from the bonds of legalism. They're freed from the worries of superstition. They're freed from the power of the demonic. You have been freed. You are at liberty. I, I, I hear, I've heard Christian people say, well, the, the devil says. If you know the devil's voice more than you know God's voice, then we need to talk about your salvation. If you are easily swayed by something that the devil does and you are not firm on your foundation of Christ Jesus, we need to talk about your salvation. That doesn't mean that I'm perfect. That doesn't mean that I've never missed it. That doesn't mean that you're never going to miss it. But you need to understand this. The devil cannot come back and try to charge you for things that you have done before you accepted Christ Jesus because that is under the blood. It is forgotten as far as the east is from the west. You are a new creation in Christ. Quit giving the devil the satisfaction. When Jesus sets a believer, believer, when Jesus sets a believer at liberty, 
He, he has done so and He fills you with the Holy Spirit as the evidence. Now you can read history books. You can Google and you can just find out just about anything that you want to believe. Or you can find people that have done their homework. People that have studied to show themselves approved and believe what they say about history. You can also read what you want to into the Bible and listen to certain so-called preachers that will tickle your ears with untruths or manipulate the Scriptures. Or you can read the Bible as it is written and be led by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of truth. The truth is, the truth is, life, liberty, and happiness were spoken of by Thomas Jefferson, and they are easily found, and I believe Thomas Jefferson knew this, that they are easily found in Jesus Christ. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are found in Jesus Christ. This morning, let's discuss this truth. I want to share this truth with you. Number one, Life is in Christ. Life is in Christ. We would not struggle with whether abortion is right or wrong if we truly understood that life is in Christ. The problem is we try to make it that life has something to do with man. But life is from God. Generation after generation has chased after all that the world has to offer. Wealth, possession, status, power, pleasure, and ease. Constantly chasing after the Joneses. Trying to keep up with the junk, trying to have more, trying to trying to do something. Got some Joneses in here. <laughs> All right, we'll keep up with the Jonah. Don't no, don't keep up with anybody. Pursue Jesus, Amen. King Solomon said this, Ecclesiastes one fourteen. I've seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed all is vanity, grasping for the wind. Now, I'm a visual. Most of you know that about me. I'm a visual. I, 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 have you ever tried to catch the wind? Oh, no, Pastor. I, that's, what, that's what Solomon said. You, know, you can't catch the wind. I mean, it's been hot, and I've always I've tried to find the place where the breeze is blowing and stand there. But you can't catch the wind. You can't harness the wind. But that's what people try to do when, they, when they're trying to grab a hold of life, fulfillment, purpose. They're, 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 trying to, they're trying to grasp the wind. We strive for good paying jobs. We, we want the perfect family. We want to make an impact on the world that we live in. None of this is bad in and of itself, yet you, it will not fulfill you. Fulfillment is not found in worldly things. Fulfillment is only found in our heavenly Creator. We can only live life to the fullest by coming to Jesus that is our source of life. John 10.10 10. John 10.10 10. We understand the first part of this says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that you would have life. And that you would have it more abundantly. I didn't come that you would have job and have it more abundantly. I didn't come that you would have cars and have them more abundantly. I didn't come that you would have title and have it more abundantly. I came that you would have life. Jesus is the source of life. And life to the full is only found in Him. The life Jesus gives is abundantly richer and fuller. It is eternal. Yet it begins immediately. The life that Jesus gave us is eternal. 
But it begins immediately. I, I, I hear people all the time, again, this is Christians that try to read into the Word instead of reading what the Word says, where, where they, when they think of eternal life, they're waiting for the day that they die to receive it. The reality is, as soon as I made Jesus Christ Lord of my life, I started my journey of eternal life. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. In the, in the, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, if you will understand it this way, if you are living for God, if, if your life is in Christ Jesus, the moment you close your eyes on this side, you open your eyes in His presence. You don't even understand. You, death, death means nothing to the child of God. I always, I always love reading about Dad Hagen, Kenneth Hagen. How he, he, Dad Hagen, I mean, I've got some things that, you know, I'm just pretty, I do the same thing over and I just, I live that lifestyle, okay? I just, I eat the same thing for breakfast, pretty much the same thing for lunch. I, I, I got habits that I live by. We, we were, we took a couple of days off this, and we're, we're in a hotel, and, and 5.30 in the morning, my eyes just open up, and I sit up, and Sheridan's like, we are on vacation. I'm like, well, you lay there, I'm getting, I'm, I'm up. I just, I've, I've been getting up at 5.30 in the morning for the last, Lots of years. It doesn't matter vacation or at home. I just wake up. I, I'm, a, I'm a pretty... Dad Hagen was that type of person. And, and, and if you read his story, it talks about how he gets up, he had two eggs, a couple pieces of bacon, glass of orange juice, half piece of toast. That was his breakfast every single morning. He'd eat breakfast, then he'd go in, he'd sit down in his, his easy chair, and he'd read his Bible, and he would pray, and then he'd get up and he'd go to the church. So he got up one morning, he goes to the table, his wife made his breakfast, his breakfast was sitting there, he ate his breakfast while he's eating his breakfast. He says, Mom, he says, I think I'm going home today. She said, Kenny, you are home, what, what are you talking about? And he just grinned, he grabbed a hold of his coffee, he went into the, to the room where his easy chair was and he sat down, he opened up his Bible like he always does. His wife says a couple minutes went by, she went in there to see if he wanted his coffee heated up, and when she walked in, there he was with his Bible in his lap, his eyes closed, a smile on his face, and he had already been in the presence of Jesus. He died. Was she sad? She was sad because her husband had passed away. Was he sad? Absolutely not. He had a smile on his face while he sat there because he went from one to the other. He had been living the eternal life, and now he was living in the eternal life. We don't fear death. The life that Jesus gave us is, is an eternal life that has already begun. We can live the abundant life because it's overflowing forgiveness, love, and guidance. We can live the abundant life because of His overflowing forgiveness, love, and guidance. That's the abundant life. I am forgiven. I am loved. And I have the Holy Spirit that directs my steps, that guides me. Because I am forgiven, my old sins are passed away. Because I am loved by the Creator, because of His guidance and His Holy Spirit that He placed in me, I can live the abundant life. As the source of life, what kind of life does Jesus offer us? He offers us everlasting life. John refers to this everlasting life as eternal life. John 17, 3. And this is eternal life that they may know You, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom You have sent. How can you know eternal life? How can you live eternal life? Because you know the Creator of life. Eternal life is the quality and the quantity of a life in Christ. Let me say that again. Eternal life is the quality and the quantity of life in Christ. Eternal life Abundant life is not the quality and the quantity of what you have in this life. Don't let, don't let the American dream, the American nightmare, think that you're not because you are in Him. The eternal life is the life that we were created to live by God. The, this life is the gift from God which we receive by trusting in Him. John wants us to see that Jesus is the source 
of abundant life and eternal life. This is very important because we all want to have a life, but sometimes we look for it in all the wrong places. I know y'all don't listen to country music, so you probably never heard that old song, looking for love in all the wrong places. I think people are looking for the abundant life in all the wrong places. Looking for happiness in all the wrong places. You're only going to find it in Christ. We think by doing certain things or by being part of a certain group, we'll have a good life. But the reality is, we can only have life, abundant life, eternal life, through Jesus Christ because He alone is the source of life. John chapter 20, verse 31. John 20, verse 31. But these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. John said, but these are written that you may believe. These are written that you may believe. The reason I, I sometimes get so... Try to find a different word because my wife says I use aggravated too much. Anyways, sometimes but people that don't have Bibles, that don't read Bibles. I mean, yeah, I know the computer, lots of things, but you don't carry your computer with you. I know you got your phone, but you know, there's something about this written word. It, they wrote them on scrolls, and those scrolls were translated and placed on onion skin for you and I to be passed down from generation to generation so that we could read the Word. I think it's interesting because I've already given you, I think, three or four passages just from the Gospel of John. And John talked about the abundant life. John talked about the eternal life. And John is talking about the life that is in Christ. And yet it's John that Jesus spoke of when He was talking to Peter. And He said, this is how you're going to die. He said, but there are going to be some that may not die. That way. And, and Peter looked at John or put, looked at Jesus. He said, are you talking about John? He said, don't you worry of yourself with him. It was John that was on the Isle of Patmos. They tried to boil him in oil. That didn't work. They tried to pluck out his eyes. He kept on preaching. So they put him on an island hoping that he wouldn't impact anybody else. But instead, he wrote a book called the Book of Revelation. In that, with no eyes, he had a revelation where he saw Jesus. How could John live a life such as that? Because he was living the abundant, eternal life in Christ Jesus. Not one of worldly things but one that was written in Christ. Jesus said that, said that knowledge of Him is eternal life. Jesus said that knowledge of Him is eternal life. And I also believe the opposite of true. Not knowing Him, not knowing Jesus, is to remain in a state of darkness and death. To know Him is eternal life. To know Him is abundant life. But to not know Him is darkness and death. Through His name is the only origin of life. Through His name refers to one's relationship with Him which secures eternal life. Life is not a reward for good conduct to be given after you die. Life is not a reward for good conduct to be given after you die. I've heard people say that, 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 that when, when, when saints have, have went on to be with the Lord, they, they make statements like, you know, well, God must have needed them more in heaven. He doesn't need you in heaven. What He needs is you to live the abundant life here on earth and tell others about Him. Man, I've, I've been to so many funerals and I've heard some things that, that ministers have said at funerals. I'm like, oh God. Why do we teach like that? Why do we preach like that? That's not true. I've got family members that go to cemeteries and they, they spend every holiday at the cemetery and, and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on grave blankets. And if that's you, the Lord bless and keep you. I don't go to cemeteries. If they don't know Jesus, they're not there. I don't want to go where they're at. 
But if they did know Jesus, I don't have to go there because I know where they're at. Hmm. Now move on. Life is a gift from God in the name of Jesus. When one accepts Christ as the revelation of God and we commit our life to Him, we are living. That's why Jesus said, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. That freedom, that liberty is in the believing. When you understand what Christ has freed you from, it sets the stage for you to live in what Christ has freed you for. Let me say that again. When you understand and you recognize what Christ has freed you from, then it sets the stage to live a life in Christ for what He has freed you for. Christ has freed us for the abundant life. Number two, liberty is in Christ. Liberty is in Christ. Galatians 5 wants to stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Liberty is found by aligning our will with God's and striving to live holy lives. Lives free from the yoke of slavery. Christ died to set us free from sin and from a long list of laws and regulations. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't die on a cross and say, okay, I'm, I'm suffering, I'm taking the beating, I'm, I'm, I'm giving my blood, I'm doing all of these things so that now you can have a list of do's and don'ts. No. The only do you have to do is call upon Me. Make Me Lord of your life. Not greasy grace, but relationship. Truth. Christ died to set us free. As we discussed last week, it's not legalism, it's liberty. Christ came to set us free, not free to do whatever we want because that would lead us back to slavery. That would lead us back to a place of selfish desires. Rather, Christ has set us free to be able to do what was impossible before. And that is to live unselfishly. When we can live a life in Christ, we can live an unselfish life. When I understand that what I do is out of relationship, it's unselfish. When I, when I, when I talk about opening my wife's door, that's not out of some legal list. It's unselfish of me to do those things. When I, when I care about what she desires, when I do things that I know make her happy, that, that is done out of an unselfish desire. I'm not looking for a reward. When I do things as unto the Lord, I'm not looking for a reward. I've already received the reward in Him. If you are forgiven, you are forgiven completely and totally. Sin, shame, and guilt are all dealt with when Jesus sets you free. You don't have to carry the burden of guilt and shame anymore. You are forgiven and truly free. Romans 8.2 Romans 8.2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life is in Christ Jesus and has made us free, liberated from the law of sin and death. In Christ we have been delivered from condemnation. We have been delivered from bondage and legalism. We have been set free from the law of sin and death. And now we are at liberty to operate in the law of the Spirit, which is in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We can trust Christ to save us. He removes our heavy burden of trying to please Him and our guilt for falling into, in, in, failing to do so. Let me say that again. When we trust Christ to save us, He removes the heavy burden of trying to please Him and the guilt for failing to do so. When you miss the mark, don't be guilty. Just repent. Understand that you're an imperfect vessel. That, that, that doesn't mean you keep on making the same mistake over and over again. That just under, that, that, that says, Jesus says, listen, I know you're going to miss it. You live in a fallen world. But I'm here. My Spirit is in you. Listen to Him. The greatest thing that we can do, church, is to tune our ears to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know if anybody in here can relate to this, men. How many married men do I have in the house? Lift your hand. Okay. 
I don't know about you married men. Oftentimes I'm praying. I said, Lord, I need to hear from heaven. And then I hear this voice. And I turn my eyes upward. I said, Lord, you sound an awful lot like my wife. (laughs) And then she's standing behind me. She says, because it's me, dummy. (laughs) When we trust Christ to save us, He removes the heavy burden. By trusting in Christ, we are loved, accepted, and forgiven. And free to live for Him. By trusting Christ, we are loved, accepted, and forgiven and free to live for Him. No believer, no believer has a right, quotations, no believer has a right to liberty in Christ. It's a gift. It's a precious gift freely given to those willing to accept it. You don't have a right. Well, I was born in America. I have a right. You have no more right than somebody born in Brazil or someone born in Africa. It is a gift. Salvation is a gift. If you've come in on Wednesday nights, you would have learned that. It's a gift. And you have to accept it. Liberty in Christ is only available because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Liberty in Christ is only available because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Our liberty provides opportunity to reach people for Christ. Our liberty provides us with the opportunity to reach others. 1 Corinthians 9.19 For though I am free from from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. My wife is born again. She's filled with the Holy Ghost. She hears from heaven, but she also gets embarrassed because I go into places. We were over in a a, uh, sandwich shop uh, when we were were out of town, and we're in this sandwich shop, and I just start talking to this guy. I said, so where do you go to church? He said, well, I don't go to church. I said, why don't you go to church? And I just start talking to him about the things of God. I mean, I'm, I'm cracking jokes. I'm making it light. I'm not up there preaching at him, but I'm just talking to him. And we sat there, and we talked for probably 10 minutes. I mean, he's walking back and forth behind the counter doing his job, and I keep following him, talking to him. And finally, he just stops and looks at me, and he he just, he's like, man, you just, you sound like a really nice guy. He says, is there something that that I can do for you? I said, well, I'd like a cup of coffee. And I said, my wife would like something to drink. He said, I'm not going to charge you for it. I said, no, sir. I said, I'm going to pay it. And so he said, well, you don't have to. He said, I'm willing to give it to you. I said, no, I'm going to pay it. He said, well, okay. So he told me how much it was when he, when he told me what it was. And it was like, I don't know, three bucks. And I handed him a five. He said, well, let me get your change. I said, no, you're a nice guy. Go ahead and keep it. And he just looked at me. I have the privilege. I have the opportunity to serve others because of what Christ Jesus has done in my life. Quit acting like you have some kind of holier than thou and start understanding that Christ has called you to be a servant to all. Liberty in Christ frees us from the bondage of sinful, selfish desires and allows us to love our neighbor. And by loving our neighbor, we we will be motivated to serve our neighbor. Liberty in Christ allows believers to live, serve, and move with purpose. Liberty in Christ allows believers to live, serve, and move with purpose. Galatians chapter 5. 22-25, through I believe this describes liberty in Christ. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 says, But the the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. It's not legalistic. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. You're not trying to please men. You're not trying to please the world. You're not trying to get what the world has. You've crucified that. We, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Don't come in here and be all spiritual. Oh, nobody be there by somebody a day. Hallelujah. Thank you. And then walk out there and act like the world. As believers in Christ, our liberty is not according to our personal thoughts and beliefs, but according to the Word and according to the Spirit. Paul said, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. The moment our opinion becomes more important than the Word of God, the moment our opinion becomes more important than the Word of God, 
we lose our liberty. Life is in Christ. Liberty is in Christ. And number three, happiness is in Christ. Happiness is in Christ. Psalm 144 verse 15 says, Happy are the people who are in such a state. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. How many of you say, My God is the Lord? You ought to be the happiest people on the planet. Tell your face, I'm the happiest person on the planet. Tell your attitude, I'm... I'm happy. I'm a Christian. I'm not a crook. Okay, true, <clears throat> true happiness comes from having a relationship with God, our Creator. That's where true and lasting happiness comes from. Not in stuff we build up here on earth. Human history is the story of mankind's search for true and lasting happiness. You ever really read this? I mean, really. I know Miss Mary has. I mean, if you've ever really, truly, not, not just, again, I, I know people that read the Bible, you know, legalistically, like, you know, I, how many of you have ever, don't raise your hand, please, but how many of you have ever done this? Lord, give me a word. All right? <laughs> don't do but, but if you'll get in there and you begin to read this, and you start, you know, find you a good, a good, a good sound translation and read it. And listen to what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Everything in here, from, from the time that Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, it's a pursuit. It's a pursuit of God pursuing and people longing for happiness, fulfillment in Him. Randy Alcorn says this. Randy Alcorn says, those who sit around waiting to be happy should not hold their breath. It will likely be a long wait. I used to sell cars back in the day. Back in the 90's, early 2000's. I used to sell cars. And people would come by and they, they, would, they would test drive five cars. We'd get in the office where they'd tell me all kinds of stuff, you know, whatever. And I'd say, are you ready to buy this? Well, we want to go and think about it. And I'd look at them and say, well, when you come back, make sure that you ask for Blue Boy. And they'd look at me and they'd say, Blue Boy, I, th I thought your name was Tim. I said, oh yeah, it is. But if you come back, I'll be the one sitting in the corner holding my breath. I, if, you're, if you're waiting for happiness, if you're, if you're waiting for the world to do something to make you happy, you're going to be waiting a long time. The pursuit of happiness is a phrase that has a sad ring to it. Think about that. The pursuit of happiness has a sad ring because you're pursuing something. It's kind of like grasping at the wind. Happiness is not found by grasping after it. Happiness is not found by grasping after it. Proverbs 16.20 says, He who heeds the word wisely will find good, and whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he. It's not grasping, it's trusting. Happiness is the birthright of those born into the family of God. Pursuit of happiness is unnecessary for the child of God. The pursuit of happiness is unnecessary for the child of God. The pursuit of happiness is not a foreign concept of Scripture. However, Jesus promised happiness to His disciples and to the future generations who by faith would put their trust in Him. John chapter 20, verse 29. Miss Alex, come on. John chapter 20, verse 29. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen Me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen Me and yet believe. Now most translations of the Bible do not use the word happy, but instead they use the Greek word makeros, which is the word blessed. Blessed. To be blessed is to experience happiness derived from contentment. In the teaching of Jesus, the distinction is that, what we, that we do not pursue happiness, but we pursue 
The one who brings happiness. We don't pursue happiness. We pursue the one who brings happiness. We don't pursue happiness. We pursue Christ. Don't pursue worldly titles. Don't pursue worldly wealth. Don't pursue worldly treasures. But pursue the provider. He has everything I need. He has everything I need. Think about that. The Bible doesn't talk about happiness. The Bible talks about blessed. Look what Jesus says. Matthew chapter 5. The Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5. Beginning in verse number 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Boy, that goes against everything that the world would say. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Boy, that goes against the world. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. We have too much pride in this nation. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you read, go through those same verses and you put it into our English vernacular, happy are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Happy are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Happy are the persecuted. Wait a minute, Pastor. I don't know about all that. It's what the Word says. It's what the Word says. We find life, liberty, and happiness when we pursue Jesus. Because Jesus is our life, our liberator, and our blessed one. Thomas Jefferson said, we are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Being saved by God's grace gives us access to abundant life. Accepting Jesus' sacrifice on the cross gives us liberty to commune with our Creator. And seeking king, His kingdom first makes our hearts happy and our lives blessed. Not only do we live in a nation founded on freedom, but we have the freedom to rejoice in the blessings of life, liberty, and happiness as children of the Most High God. Our country has so much to offer. Let me say that. Our country has so much to offer. You, you, can, you can watch the RNC or the DNC or whatever they call it. You can listen to all the speeches. You can listen to all the stars. You can listen to all the promises. But you better put your hope in Christ, not the man. 